My name is Vince Griffin. Some know me as Vince Built, um, the engine builder here at Prime Motoring. Um, I worked at Rally Spec for a few years, uh, learned a lot there. I've been working on just Subarus for the past seven years, and um, I built a lot of cool stuff. Um, a couple Rally America open class cars, uh, drag cars, and tons and tons of street engines. Today we're going to be talking about Subaru's most famous engine, the EJ. Uh, the EJ platform has been around for you know the better part of 20 years. It's a great engine. We've kind of got it figured out. A lot of people think that you know the EJ is not really a great platform to you know go racing with because they don't really know how to you know go about building one properly or choosing, you know, the proper components for their build and things of that nature. So we've kind of figured out our own little formulas for different types of racing that, that work and, uh, you know, that are proven to be reliable. A lot of inline engines and things of that nature, they become, you know, unbalanced and they have a, a bit of a higher center of gravity. The flat four is basically just, you know, a better balanced option if you're looking to make power on a decent budget, you know, or to have a fun car to drive every day. EJ is definitely the best platform. Um, I'm not going to bash the FA engine, although I'm not the biggest fan of it. Uh, it's still very, you know, early on for the FA platform. So I'm sure, you know, as time goes on, guys are going to figure out how to make it, you know, better how to stop some of the, the common issues that people have been having with it, you know, that are trying to make any kind of real power. EJ is definitely, you know, in my opinion, the best Subaru platform right now. A uh, very common failure that we see on a lot of the, uh, the EJs in the oiling system is the, the standard pickup that they use. Basically, the, the way that it's held together, they, they break at these little you know, brazes where they're held together. And it's like trying to suck a drink through a straw that's broken. It's basically what your engine's doing. It doesn't get oil it needs and then you end up spinning a bearing because nine out of 10 people don't pay attention to the oil pressure light on their dash anyway. There's a company that um, we work with quite a bit called Killer Bee. Um, the owner, Chris, is a very, very smart guy and he's come out with a solution. This very rigid uh, pickup uh, it's welded together very well. It's kind of one of those things, why wouldn't you do it? It's only so much money. Why not, you know, have some type of added insurance policy on your build? Once you understand it, it's, it's really simple. Um, a lot of the failures that occur are uh, just bad choices or bad tuning or bad, you know, <laughs> bad driving. Cast pistons are just garbage. Once you try to have any kind of fun with the car, regardless of, you know, who the tuner is, for some reason, if the cars not, if the cars don't run on like E85, it's, it's like, it's just a matter of time. It's like a ticking time bomb. So that's one of the big things we do here a lot is, you know, forged pistons. They have a really key part in, uh, in a lot of the builds. But basically there's, there's different materials too, different piston alloys. You basically have two types of forged pistons. You have a 2618 alloy and a 4032 alloy. And basically the 2618 alloy will, you know, take abuse a bit better, but it does have a bit more of an expansion property. Whereas with a 4032 piston, it isn't as resilient to, you know, abuse. Uh, however, it doesn't have the same expansion that um, you would have under a 2618. So you can run, you know, a bit tighter tolerances for, you know, piston wall clearances and that sort of thing, which may be, a bit more ideal for somebody that's looking for, you know, a forged piston, but still going to drive the car every day and not, you know, try to make 800 to 1,000 horsepower. Top mount intercoolers are, are fine. Um, the big thing people talk about with them is, you know, heat soaking and, you know, they want, they want to or they want to stay with the top mount because they don't want the turbo lag that comes along with the front mount. But in reality, the biggest thing is the temperatures. Front mount is going to see much colder air. It's not under the hood. You know, you'll see higher IATs with, you know, a top mount intercooler for sure, as opposed to, you know, a front mount. But um, front mount honestly is 
is a better option in my opinion. Um, you know, you may get a little bit more lag because of all the added piping, but at the end of the day, in my opinion, I think it's just better for the car. And honestly, you know, a lot of these kids, they build their cars to how they think they want them. And then, you know, in five, six months, they're, they're bored already and they want to upgrade anyway, so. A lot of guys, they want to make, you know, crazy power right off the bat. But a big thing, you know, for us is, have you ever driven a car that fast before, you know? We'll take the money because it's green, but at the same time, we don't want to put somebody in an unsafe situation in a car that they think they can handle when they really can't, you know? Um, and that's kind of a big thing uh, to us. We kind of want to know what, whether they can drive or not before we go handing them over a thousand horsepower car. More and more people think that, you know, 700 horsepower, they're just going to jump right in the car and, you know, own the streets. But it's not always like that. There's more to it. You gotta make sure you have other things like, you know, braking to stop. If your car goes 180 miles an hour, but you don't have the stopping power, it's not, you know, it's not really the greatest situation to be in. So if they want something high power, we'll build it and, you know, we'll, we'll show them that the car can make the power, but we're not gonna send it out the door making, you know, making full power, you know, let them get used to the car and then let them turn it up, you know make the power, dial it back down, and then, you know, as they feel more comfortable, we, we can turn it up for them. Big power with a Subaru, I would say, you know, you're starting to scratch the surface of big power with a Subaru. Once you start getting into, you know, 750, 800 horsepower, that's when you're kind of talking about big power in my eyes. Um, you know, here, 600 horsepower cars are, you know, the norm for us nowadays. So it's not really, uh, it's not really considered big power like it used to be, you know, like six or seven years ago. Now we're making a thousand horsepower with, you know, a race car. And it's kind of just like, you know, no problem for us at this point. We've kind of got it figured out, the right formula. Choosing a downpipe is more on the, uh, the tuner's end. Um, in my opinion, I mean, if you're running an internally gated uh, setup, I think it's probably best to run a divorced downpipe setup. Um, but if you're running an external, an external wastegate, you know, at that point, I mean, I really don't think it matters a whole lot whether you're running a bow mouth setup or a divorce setup. Yeah, basically any, any type of restriction in the exhaust is going to have some type of, you know, create some type of back pressure, thus not allowing the engine to breathe how it should. It's typically, uh, exhaust tubing is, you're not going to see a whole lot of uh, a difference in range, you know, throughout the aftermarket. You know, a lot of the guys, some guys they'll run four inch all the way out because they, you know, they feel it's necessary. Um, but we really don't have any problems going eight seconds with, you know, a four inch out to uh, out to a three and a half. Manual boost controller versus electronic boost controller. Back in the day, I used to be all about the manuals because I was one of those guys that you know thought it was is thought it was cool to jump out of the car and turn up the boost and see how much faster we could go. Yeah, I quickly learned that was a bad idea the hard way. Um, Nowadays, electronic boost control is definitely the way to go, um, only because, I mean, the tunability of the power range is really, you know, at your fingertips or at the tuner's fingertips at that point. Um, you know, if the turbo wants to get wild, you know, higher in the, higher in the power range and, you know, or boost wants to, you know, creep up a little, or if it wants to, you know, kind of die off, we can, we can play with that a bit and, kind of sort of you know make sure that the boost is doing what it's supposed to do because everybody's car is different regardless of whether it's the same parts or not the added tunability of you know the wastegate duty and you know boost is you know pretty important I'm gonna say 
that doing injectors, you know, as early on as possible, if you're actually looking to go the modified route is going to be the smartest thing to do only because, you know, you get a final power goal in mind and then, you know, you buy the fuel system that, you know, you're eventually going to need, even if you don't, you know, have all the parts that you're looking to run because with a stock turbo car, injectors and a fuel pump is still going to net you, you know, a decent amount of, you know, gained power with, you know, a ProTune for sure. So uh, one thing uh, a lot of guys overlook is they want to put, you know, an intake and a downpipe on the car, you know, right away. Those are two of the biggest mistakes that you can make, you know, when you're looking to modify your car. With an intake, the car will run super lean and with a downpipe, the car will overboost without any type of tuning. So those are two, two huge mistakes that, uh, you know, a lot of kids make. Tune, aside from making sure that your engine's built properly, is definitely, definitely, you know, the most important thing. From a builder's perspective, you want to know that whoever is going to be tuning, you know, your engine or your customer's engine is, you know, going to do a, a good job and they're not going to throw too much timing at it or let the EGTs get too high or let it lean out or, you know, something like that. So whoever's tuning the car has to be able to, you know, see all these things happening. And if one of them, you know, goes out of whack, if, you know, the car starts to pull timing or starts knocking or starts leaning out or, you know, any of these number of things that can happen on the dyno, you know, they got to know to back off and not to, you know, finish the pull because at that point you're damaging, you know, someone's, <laughs> someone's brand new investment. You know what I mean? So tuning is definitely, definitely, I'd say most of the most important part for sure. When is it smart to think about reinforcing the block? Um, when you're starting to get into like the, uh, the 550 horsepower area is kind of when, uh, is kind of when we really start to see a lot of the, you know, the cylinder failures, you know, the sleeve, the cylinder liners cracking, um, you know, and that sort of thing. Basically when you close deck an engine or reinforce it, or sleeve it, whichever route you choose to go. Um, you know, basically you're looking to prevent the, the cylinder from distorting under, you know, extreme pressure and heat. The, the difference between sleeves and closed deck is a closed deck, you're basically retaining the factory the factory cylinder, the factory sleeve, um, and basically they machine a ledge into, you know, in, onto, the, onto the cylinder and into the edge of the block, the, the water jacket. And basically these inserts are, you know, are pressed in and basically cut to, you know, be a perfect machine finish for the, for the head mating surface. Whereas a sleeve, you, have to make sure that it's like in a temperature controlled environment everything's got to be real precise and then you ba you actually cut out the factory sleeve and then you would press in you know the new the new sleeves uh, as a builder i personally prefer sleeves um, only because you know you're you're completely eliminating the factory uh the factory cylinder at that point you know, so there's no question in the back of my mind that, you know, the factory liner could possibly still have an issue. Uh, for road racing and rally, um, stuff like that, turns, lots of turns, lots of, you know, tight corners. We go with, you know, a smaller turbo, of course, but something that's gonna hold up to, you know, high RPM all the time. Um, whereas with, you know, a drag, a drag setup, car's not running, you know, for nearly as long and um, is being rebuilt, you know, more frequently than, you know, the rest. The pro drive car that Mark Higgins was racing on the Isle of Man that he just set the record for, 
you know, ProDrive even came out and said that every 400 miles, the car's getting, you know, torn down and rebuilt, you know, for piston rings alone. So depending on the amount of, you know, horsepower your car's pushing and, you know, your driving habits, Nothing lasts forever, but, you know, we can choose the right parts to make the thing last, you know, 100,000 miles if it's, you know, if it's built properly and tuned properly and not driven ignorantly, you know, there's no reason why it shouldn't last. For a lot of the street cars we build here, you know, injectors, fuel pump, you know, pro tune at minimum. Um, for autocross and stuff like that, um, a lot of guys will choose to go with like an upgraded crankshaft only because, you know, the car's going to be seeing high RPM all the time. And then in terms of power, looking for, you know, a real mid-range type of setup, not something that's going to be, you know, crazy top-end power, but not something that's going to run out of steam, you know, on the straights and, you know, stuff like that. A big mistake would be you know, hearing your engine making a, a ticking or a knocking noise and continuing to drive it. If you hear any kind of funny ticking or knocking coming from your engine, shut it down and get it towed to the nearest, <laughs> to your nearest mechanic and then go from there. Do your oil changes on time. A lot of these, you know, dealerships will tell you, you know, you can change your oil every 7,500, that's fine. From an engine builder's perspective, it's not fine and that's a way for them to you know get you to buy a new engine you know later on down the road synthetic oils usually like daily driven not crazy power you know you can get away with you know every 5,000 I I'm still a part of the every 3,000 rule unless you know the guys run an E85 in which case that actually will dilute the oil so on E85 cars, we still recommend that the oil be changed every thousand miles. On the high power cars, um, again, nine times out of 10, they're running E85. So we're telling them to change the oil every thousand miles, regardless of their oil separator that they're running. Um, I'm typically not a fan of, you know, retaining the factory PCV valve anywhere on the car, to, regardless of, you know, power. The car makes over 400 horsepower. I don't really, like the idea of having a PCV valve anywhere on the car. So we typically run the, uh, the competition series air oil separators, which, you know, eliminates that completely. If you're looking to modify your car, the best thing you could do as soon as possible is put an air oil separator on the car. Um, it's another one of those cheap insurance policies for your engine, uh, basically eliminating any type of uh, oil that could be being sent into the charge system, thus lowering octane and, you know, causing knock and all that unhappy stuff. A lot of these kids, you know, they, they get a 500, 600 horsepower car and they think, you know, just because they got a built motor and, you know, all this stuff, nothing's ever going to happen, you know, nothing can break. I mean, you know, we, we built 1,000 horsepower cars but, you know, again, we tear them down and refresh them because, you know, again, like I said, nothing lasts forever. But, you know, you come to us so that we can give you the formula to make what you're looking for last as long as possible.